Hey guys, thank you for joining me today. Today we're going to talk about Enneagram Type 3. And we're going to be looking at the best and worst character traits of Type 3s. And we're going to be looking at this book. It's actually the book that uh, started all of this. Uh, several years ago when I picked this book up, The Enneagram Made Easy by Renee Barron and Elizabeth Waggle. I... Um, I this is the first book that that I read on the Enneagram and since then I've read a lot more books about it but uh sometimes it's good to go back to the beginning and look at where it all started and she's they have a list at the beginning of each chapter that just lists about seven or eight different strengths and seven or eight different weaknesses or we could say potential weaknesses but I just want to go back and look at those and just talk about them now that I've been you know, on the inside of this for, for a long time and just sort of look at it from a fresh perspective. Okay, so before we get started, just a reminder that in the description below is a link to my website, tomlehue.com, where I do offer Enneagram coaching. It's essentially life coaching, but it's based on the Enneagram. And, you know, it helps us know so much about ourselves and not only where we're at and kind of how we see the world, but also it helps us see a path forward to what growth and health look like. And this can be exceptionally helpful for threes because realize all of us are kind of stuck in certain impulses and compulsions that work for us about 70 or 80% of the time. But there's always going to be this 20%, you know, 15% of the time where the very same impulses that bring us success in one area of our life can actually keep us stuck in other areas. And it's important for us to see this. And then, you know, the Enneagram kind of suggests what balance and health would look like. And sometimes it can kind of surprise you. Um, it may push you in some directions that aren't very comfortable for you. And then, of course, I do a lot of marriage coaching. And, you know, when I know your type and your spouse's type, it's, uh, it's, it's, we can get over the target. Let's say it that way. We can get over the target pretty quickly as to what the problems might be and then how we can interact in a more positive way and have the best marriage possible. Realize I'm a type seven. I, I just want you to be happy. I want you to feel fulfilled. I want you to live rich and full lives and live with passion. And in that, I think threes and sevens can agree. We both are assertive types that kind of seek to want to get the best out of life and and do all that we can. All right, so let's see. Let's jump into this information and, and just kind of let's see what happens. There's no grand plan here. I don't have any, you know, we're just kind of, remember I am a seven and an ENFP and I'm just kind of um, looking at the words and we'll see what happens, okay? So here's, let's start with the strengths. Um, you know, the three is called the achiever, the the professional, the performer, um, and also what see three wing two is called the charmer. And, um, so let's, let's look at these words. All right. Number one, uh, threes at their best can be optimistic, confident, industrious, efficient, self-propelled, energetic, and practical. Okay. Um, optimistic. I think that's something that maybe we might share uh, alike. Optimistic, you know, is that general view that things are going to work out, that general view that that um, I'm going to stay positive. Even though my circumstances might be difficult around me, and even though I might feel overwhelmed at times, and I might feel like I want to quit, or I might want to give up, there may be many voices that are against me, but optimism is a general outlook that things are going to work out, that things are going to be okay, that Maybe I have what it takes in order to overcome or accomplish this goal. And so that general sense of positivity. Now, you're not one of the positivity types. Seven, nine, and two are what are called the positivity types. But but I think this, this assertive mixed with goal setting and then facing challenges might make you appear very optimistic in the face of challenges and struggles. Now, that being said... You remember, your line to disintegration is to nine. So when things are not going well, you might pick up sort of that complacency or apathy that might look a little bit like a nine. No offense to our nines out there. Um, but optimism and confident. Confident. You know, think about what that, what that brings to the table. 
When everybody in the team is feeling overwhelmed or frustrated or defeated, to have somebody come in that's confident, to have somebody that comes into the room that that you know stands tall and looks people in the eyes and rallies the team, that is an amazing, amazing quality to have to help a team move forward. People are attracted to confidence. I mean, they are. People are attracted to confidence. We're not attracted to apathy or indifference. We're not attracted to, you know, that sense of failure or defeat. We all feel that at times, but to be able to have resilience, I think that's probably a key word for sevens and threes, that resilient mindset, that, that uh, you know, that overcoming mindset, that confident mindset that, like, like I need to pull myself up and 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 get back into the fight, get back into this game. I need to uh, you know dust off my uh, my wounds, dust off my failures and my setbacks, and be confident going forward. I I, I came up with uh, some some statements that I think a three might say to a team that was defeated. And I just put them here on my computer. It says, let's remember our purpose. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. <laughs> I like that. Um, it sounds kind of like those, you know, if you go to YouTube and you you type in like motivational workout videos and it's basically just people, it's basically just threes yelling at each other about, you know, overcoming obstacles and be a lion, don't be sheep. You know, uh, it, it could be maybe some eights in there. Um, maybe some sevens, but it's mostly threes, I think, yelling at other threes, you know, to rally them up and remember these core values. And I think, I think it's important that you remember or, you know, hear this voice inside your head, but I think it's much more important that you share this voice with the rest of us. Realize the rest of us are not threes, right? So when we're in a team and we get defeated and discouraged, or maybe we're just apathetic and indifferent and complacent, which happens to us, you know, we just kind of get settled into the status quo. To have a three come into our group, sort of shake us up and say, come on, guys, you know, we could get to the next level here if we if we work at this. If we band together and we have a vision for the future, we could really, you know, you could really improve your game. I mean, that somebody who's confident and powerful and who is driven saying that to the rest of us can be very inspirational and we need to hear your voice but sometimes it seems like you know it's hard for you to be that voice because you're so much under the burden of it yourself to prove your own worth and value you know you feel the weight of that that it's hard for you maybe to to share that with the rest of us uh, we faced challenges before, and each time we've come back stronger. This time is no different. Every small effort you put in today brings you closer to the finish line. Keep pushing forward. So I was just kind of playing around with, you know, some of the statements that uh, threes might make to a discouraged team. Challenges are proof we're stretching beyond our comfort zone. Um, it does. It sounds like one of those, you know, like you got this boxer on the front, you know, with like this steady beat, and then you just got these challenges. Right. So optimistic, confident, industrious. Industrious means you can figure out a way to get it done. You can figure out a way to get it pushed forward. A lot of times I notice when I'm coaching people that three wing fours often are like INTJs on Myers-Briggs, NT, efficiency, and TJ, effectiveness. And you can really summarize a three wing four INTJ you're not the only INTJs. A lot of times eights, you know, can be uh, ENTJs or INTJs. But that that value for efficiency and effectiveness. And think about that. That's industrious. That is, we're going to find a way. We're going to make a way. I don't care how early we have to wake up, how late we have to go to bed. There's this boulder that's chasing me that I have to prove my worth and value. And maybe you don't like to see it that way. You know, you may just feel like you're driven and, you know, confident and want to focus on being effective and get frustrated with incompetency. But I want you to kind of look at it from another perspective is there's this boulder that's chasing you, that's telling you if you don't, what happens if you don't? What happens if you take it easy? What happens if you take a break? How do you feel? How do you feel if you relax or if you just do nothing? Or how does it feel if other people perceive you that way? Now, that feeling of shame or embarrassment 
from other people thinking that you're lazy or not competent or that you, you know, are a goofball. One of the differences between sevens and threes is we're much more okay with people perceiving us sometimes as a goofball. Um, we, we're not a worth and value type. So it's, it's much easier for us to have people laugh at us. I mean, obviously we don't like people really laughing at us and thinking we're idiots, but, um, but that, that idea of making people laugh or making people feel at ease, remember we're an anxiety type. So making people laugh makes us and them feel more at ease and calms our anxiety. But for you guys, you know, industrious, Three wing four, often INTJs. I noticed that a lot of times three wing twos, you know, the charmer, and they got more of that two relationship orientation, tend to be more like ENFJs. Um, you know, NF is individuality and FJ is harmony. So everybody's unique. Um, wait, yeah, everybody's unique, everybody's different, and we should all work together to create uh, an environment where everybody is cared for and, you know, works together um, and very sensitive to how they're being perceived by others um, and that other people are respecting them and other people are connecting with them and find them, you know, valuable. Okay, so industrious. Well, that's, that's not bad. That's great. It's great to be industrious. It's great to take a little bit and figure out how to make it work. Okay. Industrious, efficient. I already said that, right? Efficient is not wasting time, not letting yourself get distracted, making sure you take the shortest path to get there, to get the results. And notice threes are very result oriented people. And you say, what's wrong with that? Well, nothing. It's just, this might make you a little bit too pragmatic for some of the people around you. If your goal is to get to the result, then let's say it this way. Your goal is not to be good. Uh, if your goal is to be good, that's different than your goal is to get to the result. And you can see where some of the deception might come in here. If two people are trying to get to the same goal, but one of them is a one and has this burden to do it the right way and to be good, and the other one is a three who just has the result who just wants to get to the goal. You might take a shortcut. You might, you know, color outside the lines or from the one's perspective, cheat. You're cheating to get what you want. You're being deceptive. You've got to take the high road. And the three's thinking, yeah, but the low road gets there a lot faster. Now, I'm not saying that all threes are like this. I'm just saying it's, it's more how you're wired than now self-preservation threes. You guys are the counter threes that often look like ones. And you not only are a three, but you have this desire to be seen as good and realize that's very different than a one wanting to be good. A one wants to be good and be on the side of good. A self-preservation three wants to be known as good or be perceived as good, but you're still very much a three. Okay. So interesting, interesting nuance there. Um, efficient, self-propelled. Self-propelled. I don't need something outside of me to motivate me. I don't need somebody pushing on me. It might help. It might not help. But I don't need some somebody pushing on me or holding me accountable in order for me to be able to move forward. It is within me. Actually, it's behind you. It's a boulder that tells you that you're not a person of worth and value if you don't accomplish or achieve or push yourself or, you know, stay busy or productive or active. Um, you know, there's some, I, I just kind of want you to turn around and face that boulder every once in a while and realize that it's not true. It's a story you're telling yourself. We all do this in different ways, but it's not true. It's okay for you to just be a person at times and to relax and to take time to connect with other people or to take time to just enjoy life. Or sometimes I always say it like this with threes, sometimes riding a bike with your family is just riding a bike with your family. It's not an opportunity for you to test yourself. It's not really an opportunity for you to push yourself. It's not an opportunity for you to go the distance. Okay. It's really just an opportunity for you to enjoy life and be present with your family. And I think it's helpful for you to remember that, that sometimes a walk with your family or even a walk by yourself is really just a walk. It's not 
it's not necessarily a time for you to push yourself and overcome obstacles and think about your next goal. And notice how whenever you accomplish a goal, whatever it is, it just gets replaced with another goal. And you're always kind of delaying happiness. Like at some point when I overcome this or when I reach this level or when I level up and I leverage my, okay, when you get to this level, then I'll be content and happy and I'll feel great and I'll feel satisfied and I'll no longer need to push myself. Not true. You know what I'm talking about. You get to that goal and then it just, the celebration is very quick. The celebration is very light. And immediately you wake up the next morning, like what's next, what's next. And you feel kind of dead inside. If you don't have that goal, if you don't know what we're working for, if we don't know what the target is, if we don't know how to prove our worth and value by accomplishing an objective, what happens to you? You probably go to nine. Like, what am I doing here? I don't know. I guess it's just sitting, just doing time, just sitting here waiting for life to happen to me. I feel dead inside because I don't know what I'm supposed to be pushing for. You know, I want you to think about the difference between being driven and being called. So driven people are very anxious, agitated, frustrated. They're very wired up. They're very high caffeine. You know, they're very focused on getting to that goal. Driven, driven. You think driven. That's like a bunch of cows with cowboys and dogs driving a herd of cattle. They're pushing. You hear that in the driven? It's like cattle being pushed. And there's something behind you that's pushing you that you can't just relax or be okay or slow down. No, I'm driven. And you know, we, even as Christians, we love that concept of purpose driven, driven. Okay, fair enough. But there's a difference between that and like a sense of calling in your life. Like, like there's some, there's some higher voice, there's some higher purpose that's, that's pulling you toward it. And, and, and you know, you're going to get there. You know, I'm going to end up there because that's, that's the direction I'm going in. That's the course I've set for my life. And there's this calm peace that I can have because I don't need to push myself because I know that everything's working according to a purpose that's pulling me forward. And I can, I can move with purpose, but I don't have something pushing me. I have something pulling me toward it. Um, and there is a, a, a confidence that could be gained um, and also, you know, less stress about how other people are viewing me. Um, let me just, let me just say it like that. Okay. You're not who people say you are. You're not just like, just like a seven on the fear side needs to hear the message. I'm not what I have. Well, I have all these guitars and I have all my collection and I have all my friends and I have all my, uh, you know, exciting appointments coming up with all my adventures. Okay. Five, six, and seven, you're not what you have, the resources, the knowledge, the, the safety plans, eight, nine, and one, you're not what you do. And you guys on the worth and value type, it's helpful for you to remember, I'm not who they say I am. I'm more than that. I am who I am regardless of what people think about me, regardless of how people perceive me. And I love admiration. I love appreciation. I love validation. But even if I don't get that from people, it doesn't change who I am and it doesn't change my purpose in life and it doesn't change my calling in life. And that that is real growth, guys. That is like being centered and, and being on a, on a strong foundation. Because if, if you need desperately for other people to think certain things about you, um, then you may find yourself playing to the crowds. And that's what vanity is all about. Vanity is all about that. And that's what deception is. It's playing to the crowd and being very focused on the image that you're managing. And it's, you know, sometimes, okay, sometimes that is important. There's a lot of people... They could work on their image a little more. There's a lot of, lot of us that need to like work on our image because we're not paying attention at all to how we're coming across and we make things awkward and uncomfortable for everybody and we need to polish up that image. But for you guys, you probably are too focused on how you're being perceived and on your image 
and people's perceptions of you. In other words, the external stuff. You may be a little too focused without even realizing it on the external. And then what are you not paying attention to? The internal. How are you doing as a person? Okay, what do I mean by this? Let me give an example. Well, you know, you go into a gym and what do you see? You see a bunch of threes working out, great bodies, you know, focused on their on their health. But I'm not really sure it's their health. It's more like fitness. It's what people can see. It's the external. And so they're spending a lot of time and a lot of effort and a lot of work in order to have this body that gets this response and this reaction from people. And I need to look at myself in the mirror and I need to see, I need to see the results. But what might be not thought about is what about your health, your actual health, like your organs, okay? Think about it like that. The insides, the guts. Because you may be downing so much protein powder that you're destroying your kidneys. Or you may be taking so many supplements or medications or whatever to get this, to stay in this state, that who knows what you're doing to your heart? Who knows what you're doing to your organs? And then let's just take it a step farther. What about your relationships? Are you putting this much effort? Are you putting this much energy that you put into work and perhaps physical fitness and your personal development? Are you putting that much effort and work into your marriage? or into your family life with your kids, or into your community life with your friends, or God forbid, into your spiritual life and your relationship with God, or into your hobbies, your hobbies and interests. You know, it's normal. Let me just say that. It's normal for people to have things they're interested in outside of work. So what hobbies and interests do you give yourself permission to enjoy simply for the sake of enjoying life? Okay, so self-propelled, energetic, and practical. Energetic, good. Practical, great. Practical, think pragmatic. What is it actually going to take to get this done? Not theoretical. So the opposite might be like living in your head or living in theories, but actually like pavement, feet to the pavement, feet on the road, getting results, making things happen, getting things done. Practical, useful productive. All of these are great. I mean, they're really great. Okay. So these are some of the strengths. I know I feel like you probably feel like I beat you up already and I'm not trying to, but these are the strengths. Now we're going to look at the weaknesses. You're like, oh my gosh, we just, those were the strengths. Here's the weaknesses. Deceptive. That's number one in this book. I didn't write it. Look, there it is. Deceptive. That means false. It means you're not really who people think you are. So who are you? That's a good question. If you're not really what you appear to be, then who are you really? Who are you now that you think you know who you are? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a type three. Okay, got it. What else? What's beneath that surface? Is Do you sense a certain hollowness? Do you sense a certain emptiness in there? that you don't really want to face. Um, you give off this vibe or this appearance, but when we get beneath it, see, this is why threes don't want to work with me. This is why you guys don't want to work with me because, because this is real growth and this is real challenge and this is really painful stuff. Threes look at the Enneagram like, how can mastering this help me leverage my strengths in order to accomplish the next goal? And, 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 Realize that's just staying stuck in your impulse. Why do you need that goal? Why do you need that? Why do you feel that you need to accomplish these things? You see? See what we're doing here? We're undermining all of it. And that's what the Enneagram does. It says, do you see this false self that you're being prone to be this zombie self, as Beatrice Chestnut calls it? You're in this zombie mode. Yeah, you're getting a lot done. You're very successful, accomplished a lot, proving your worth and value. But are you awake in there? Like, hello, McFly, hello. Who, who's, who's driving this car? Because everything you're doing is very predictable stuff that I could read about in any Enneagram book. So if you could stop that for a minute, think about it like this. If you could stop doing what you're doing right now, what would you do? What would you do with yourself? What would you do with your time? 
If you could just pause, here you are. Like, guys, I've had coaching appointments with threes who they never had time to get married. And they're literally at work while we're doing the appointment and they're working. They're doing this while I'm talking to them. It's seven o'clock at night. It's seven o'clock at night and they're not at home. They're in their office. And the whole time I'm trying to talk to them, they're literally tapping away on their keyboard, making deals and getting things done and brokering deals and selling houses. And they're talking to me like this. Yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm like, man, can you take a breath for a minute? Can you just relax for a second? Look at all this drivenness. And why is it only in certain areas of your life that give you the most amount of feedback? So you're a millionaire. That's amazing. You're a millionaire on the outside. But on the inside, you might, you're like a starved little girl. You're like a starved little child on the inside because you don't focus at all on the inner person, but only on the external and, and that's sad. That's sad. So let me ask you again. If you weren't doing what you're doing right now, see the boulder chasing me? I'm driven. There's cows and dogs barking at me. There's this, there's this sense that if I don't prove my worth and value, that if, if you weren't doing what you're doing right now, what would you do with yourself? What would you do with your time? Let me give you four hours today. How are you going to spend them? No, 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 no. You can't, you can't do what you normally do. You, you can't, you can't, you know, push forward, aim high. What, what's some of my, don't let today's struggle define us. Let's define the outcome through resilience. Challenge is proof. You're stretching beyond your comfort zone. This is where growth happens. Believe in the vision we're building. Every effort counts. Okay. Turn, turn that off for a minute. It's great when you share that voice with everybody else, but turn it off in your own head for a minute. And what do you hear? Uh, probably shame and embarrassment. Like, I don't, I don't feel comfortable doing nothing. I don't feel comfortable sitting still. I don't either. I'm a seven, but for different reasons, right? I don't feel comfortable just sitting on a porch and looking out over the valley and just relaxing or meditating or praying or having a conversation about nothing with somebody. I feel like we should be more productive here. I feel like I'm wasting time. I feel like I can't slow down. Remember in City Slickers, uh, Curly, he says to um, whoever the main character, Billy Crystal, whoever his character is, he says, I know you city folks. You spend 50 weeks a year getting tied up in knots and then you come out west to try to untie those knots. And, and that's what you're doing. I mean, literally tying yourself in knots, but it's not 50 weeks, it's 52 weeks a year. What would your life look like if you could relax just a little bit? If you could calm down the fire just a little bit, you might be easier to connect to, you might be easier to relate to, you might be easier to be around, and you might feel, if you could face this dragon, face this dragon, that's chasing you. How different would your life look if you could pause for a minute? You might feel some feelings and feelings don't really have a place in your life, do they? You know what, you know what you could do? Get out an old photo album. I know you say, what's a photo album? Well, there were these big books that we used to have a long time ago with pictures in them. Go, go find some photos on your iPad or something of when your kids were little or when you were little. And just let yourself go back there for a moment and flip through those pictures and realize time is passing you by. Time is passing you by. And you may be storing up a lot of trophies and a lot of money in your bank account, but what are you storing up with your kids? What are you storing up with your husband, your wife? What are you storing up? How are people going to remember you when you're gone? Because it's not going to be long. Deceptive, false, exaggerated, exaggerated, perception, uh, presentation of yourself, a presentation of yourself. I, I want to get to know you. Notice what's right next to you as a three, four, 
Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? It's almost like there's a design here. Three, false, actor, mask, persona, deceptive, vanity, right next to four, authentic, real, genuine, true to myself. Look how they're right next to each other. Can you see that every three needs a little bit of fourness and every four could probably use a little bit of threeness to blend and harmonize to help us stretch and grow and balance? That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Okay, number two, narcissistic. Ooh, ouch. You know, there's a lot of talk right now about narcissism. I mean, type it into YouTube. There's a thousand videos that come up, right? And sometimes it's presented as though these people are just flawed, run away from them. They're terrible. They can't be fixed, you know. But from the Enneagram perspective, the Enneagram doesn't use words like narcissist or ADHD or OCD or ODD, or it doesn't use any of these labels, right? It just has numbers and that's it. Names and numbers, right? And when I think about narcissism, self-love and self-referencing and not being able to empathize with others, and I, I kind of think probably some unhealthy three-wing fours probably, and maybe some unhealthy eight-wing sevens or seven-wing eights, the assortive types, usually. Now, covert narcissism is something else, and that was well, a different subject, but overt you know, it tends to be these assertive types when they get a little too focused on me, mine, how I'm doing and not caring about others. And I, I don't I, 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 I worry about this narcissism label because people throw it on others and then they're like, now I could run away from you and be mean to you and despise you because, look, you are this label. Not to minimize it, I'm just saying. The Enneagram doesn't use that language. Just It just kind of might say unhealthy three or unhealthy seven wing eight. Or other types could probably be narcissists. But that's kind of my experience from working with people is I kind of see it, those types often. And look, I'm not making it up. It's right there. I didn't write it in there. It's right there in the book. Under type threes, unhealthy could look a little focused on themselves and how they're being perceived by others to the point that it's unhealthy, to the point that other people are like, get over yourself. Oh my gosh, get over yourself. That's what other people are thinking. Get over yourself. Like everything you're doing is, is positioning yourself. Somebody like this, unhealthy three, everything you're doing is positioning yourself or posturing and man, the ones out there, the eights out there, and everybody else, the sixes out there, they're going to look at that and they're going to see right through that crap. At first, they might be very impressed. Wow, wow, wow. But a steady diet of hearing you talk about you, people are eventually going to go, oh my goodness, you would be an amazing firefighter if you could just get over yourself. You would be an amazing boss if you could get over yourself. And you're like, what, what am I doing? You may not even be aware of what you're doing. Okay, let me say it like this. When a one becomes a manager, they're probably focused on how do I turn this, this, this organization around? How do I turn this team around? How do I make things right? How do I get everybody organized and scheduled to accomplish this task, to leave everything better than I found it. When a nine becomes a manager, they're probably thinking, how do I make this an environment where everybody feels heard, everybody feels important, the customer feels like they're valued? How do I make this in, this these people on this team feel like everybody has a place that matters and that everybody has a position where they feel like they're heard, valued, and a part of the team. But what's the tendency of a three? Now that you're the manager, how do I use these people to posture and position myself to prove myself to get to the next level of supervisor? Now, you may hear that and be like, that's not me. I'm not like that. I'm not like that. Okay, in your head, you may not be like that at all. But the people working with you might feel like you're like that. 
So just slow down long enough to realize that. Like, whoa, if I get this position of responsibility, I need to be careful that I don't make this about me. I need to be careful that I focus my attention on the job that needs to be done and on the people that I'm working with and try to empower everyone to do their best and accomplish their best and have a great working environment and make sure we get our customers taken care of. This isn't about me. This isn't about me. And that may be a challenging realization or a challenging thought that you need to remind yourself, like, I need to quit thinking about how I'm being perceived as the manager and that if people are noticing what I'm doing, because everybody around you is going to get the perception that this is about you. And that is what narcissism is, is everything that happens is some kind of commentary about me. It's some kind of commentary about my value and my worth and how people are perceiving me. And I'm telling you, it's it's so ironic that threes who are so focused on, on becoming admirable could end up being disdained for the for trying for trying so hard to become admirable, you can end up the villain in the movie really quickly. The villain. Okay. And not achieving that goal of being admired, but being disdained by the group. And this is why. This is why. So you got to slow down long enough to say, whoa, is that happening right now? Is that happening in my group? How do I get my focus off of me and back on them and their success? And really think about it. That's that line to six. When the three can join the team, when the three can join the village and work for the whole team, three line to six. Sixes are the team, man. They are the village. Sixes want to hide in a team. And we don't need people to hide in the team. We need people to lead the team. And guess what you do as a three? Lead the team. Lead the team forward. But an unhealthy three, they can't lead the team. They got to prove to the team that I'm the best. I'm the best. And what are people going to say? Man, this is all about you. This is all about you. And that, ugh, people are going to, okay. Uh, pretentious. 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 I looked that up because I was like, what is meant by pretentious? Okay, let me get my nerd glasses on. Pretentious. Okay, pretentious. Overly concerned with their image, their status, and their outward success. Pretentious. Next is vain. Seeks admiration and validation. Focus more on how I'm perceived than who I truly am as a person. Let me just stop for a minute and say admiration is 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 needed by all of us. All of us need some level of admiration or appreciation or validation. It's not a weakness to need that. It's just probably something you ought to know about yourself is that you seek admiration. And think of it like this, you're always sending out sonar to the world needing a certain message to come back to you. You matter, you're loved, you're valued, you're amazing, you're the best at what you do, you're industrious, you're a hard worker, you're caring. You, you need some message to come back to you where people basically say, great job, Nick, you knocked it out of the park. Couldn't have done it without you. Great job on that proposal, great job. You tend to need a cheerleader in your life how do you function if you don't have that? Do you start to get disheartened and discouraged and frustrated? Because I can see the three teenager. Okay, let's go on this journey, right? Drink water. Let's suppose this teenager is a three and he's got a dad who's an eight or a one. Okay, one of those anger types up there or even a nine wing eight or something like that, right? And so this kid goes out for the football team and he makes a team. He comes home, never ignore a three, by the way. He comes home, dad, did you see what I just did? Okay, because every type does, right? And three says, look at what I'm doing. Look at what I did. So the three comes home, dad, I just joined the football team. And the dad, instead of admiration, instead of reaffirming his son's value and giving him the admiration he's seeking, the dad says something else instead, gives off a sonar 
the sonar, dad, did you see what I just did? Dad, I just made the team. Okay. And the message that comes back is, ah, football's nothing like it was when I was a kid. Back then it took men and men played and we hit each other and we liked it. We didn't care. What's that three going to feel? I sent out a message, dad, I joined the football team, but he gets back. Oh, you're just a, a wimp. You know, that football isn't what it used to be. That's no big deal. So now he feels minimized and diminished. So what's he going to do next? Dad, dad, not only did I make the football team, but dad, I made the honor society. Dad, look at me. Look at me. I made the honor society. And the dad says, instead of, wow, son, I'm really proud of you. Took a lot of work. I'm, mom, and, mom and I are super proud of you. Instead of doing that, the dad minimizes and diminishes again and says, oh, yeah, the school nothing like it was when I was a kid. When I was a kid, it was hard. We actually had to do math. And these kids today, they fly by and everybody gets an A. So the dad minimizes and diminishes. Dad, look at me. Dad, look what I'm doing. Okay, so do you see how this boy is going to just continue to push himself toward one and another arena to prove something? And what if he doesn't get that? admiration that he needs. And it's not wrong to need it. We don't live in the Garden of Eden. Okay. So we all need some admiration, appreciation, validation in life because we're all a little broken. And when he doesn't get what he needs, you might see the son lose heart and give up. And do you see, looks like a nine, right? No longer pushing themselves, no longer self-propelled no longer energetic, optimistic, confident, industrious, efficient, practical, none of that anymore. Now, disengaged, disenfranchised, disheartened, apathetic, indifferent, unfocused, physically present, but I'm not here anymore. I feel hollow, empty, and maybe a little admiration from those around you might build you back up again. Now, there's a sense in which if you can catch this going on, you might be able to limit some of the damage that can happen in your life or in your day if you don't get that admiration. Like you can sort of give it to yourself, you know, like, hey, I'm working hard. I feel good about what I'm doing. I feel confident in the work I did. And even if other people don't recognize that or give me the admiration I want, I still, I still can pull myself up and keep going. I still can. If you live with a three, give them admiration. Please give it to them. I don't care who you are. You're an eight and you're like, well, they shouldn't need it. They should just do what they want to do without everybody having to. It doesn't matter. They need a lot of admiration. And if they don't get it from you, they could become very discouraged and disheartened, or they may just walk away from you, which is probably what's going to happen. They're going to walk away from you and they're going to go to the people that give it to them. And the people that give it to them may not be the best people for them. They may not really care about them or love them. So if you love them and care about them, you've got to meet each other's needs. And threes often have a very strong need for admiration. You say, what is that even? It means noticing what they're doing and then giving praise to it, giving attention to it and saying, great job. You nailed it. Knocked it out of the park. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. If you have a three, you have a child that's a three, you better learn how to say, I'm so proud of you. Mom and I are so proud of you. Fantastic job. Do not starve this child of your admiration, pour it out on them, but not to the point that it doesn't mean anything anymore. Okay. So there's always a fine balance with all of this, right? Okay. So let's wrap this up. Vain, seeking admiration and validation, vain, surface level. Okay. Vanity, superficial, vindictive, vindictive. What's that mean? Vindictive. It means what if people don't notice me, but they notice them instead? Or what if people thwarted my progress and the reason why I didn't succeed was because of Jerry over there? Mm. So the three could become vindictive, like sabotaging others, retaliating, holding grudges against people that are limiting them or who are prospering when I'm not. And again, this goes back to like image over substance that you got to be careful of. Overly competitive. I got a compete mindset. 
competition mindset. Put yourself in that compete mindset. Push yourself. It can be such a wonderful message when it's appropriate, or it can just get tiresome to you and everybody else. Like, what? why are you always competitive? You know, what, what would be the balance to being competitive? We got to get into competitive mindset. Okay. Competitive on the one hand, what would be the balance to that? Collaborative. Collaborative. Do you know this word collaborative? Collaborative means we're going to collaborate. You and I are going to work together to collaborate. And maybe together we could accomplish more than we would accomplish if we were competing against each other. Not everything's a competition. Okay, my success doesn't mean anything about you. Yes, it does. Everything means something about me. No, it doesn't. Most things don't mean anything about you. You're not in competition with everybody. I'm in competition with myself. No, you're not in competition with yourself. I mean, yeah, you are in competition with yourself all the time. What if you could relax that a little bit? What if you could face that dragon? What if you could slow down long enough to face that dragon? What, how would different, what would you do if you weren't competing against yourself right now? I got to wake up at five in the morning because that's when the lions get up. I don't want to be a sheep. I got to wake up. I got to push myself. I got to overcome obstacles. I got to prove. Who are you proving this to? Who's impressed? Who do you need to impress so badly? that you're willing to give up your life to do it. Vindictive, overly competitive, threatened when criticized by others, or exposed by others. Exposed. What does this mean, exposed? Well, it means there's this false image outside that I've got to maintain, and if people can peek through that, I would feel exposed. And that feels embarrassing. Seeking revenge rather than seeking revenge rather than processing the hurt of failure or embarrassment. So instead of allowing yourself to like grieve and suffer the loss of a failure or embarrassment, no, hmm, I'm going to seek revenge and show everybody that that other person isn't so great. I'm going to put you know, itching powder in their shoes. And so other people will see. <laughs> and, and I'm telling you guys, if you're not careful, you will turn into the villain in the story. You think you're the hero. Okay, let me give you an example. Remember Gaston in Beauty and the Beast? A three. He thought he was the hero. But everybody around him can see that he's the villain in the story. Don't become the villain in your story trying to become the hero. Whew. All right, guys. See you next time. Be present to life.